Well, I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here. Can I have a copy of your notes? No. I'll make it look great. Yeah. Yeah. You realize that what's on here and what I say is two different things. Those tests have been moving so no one knows me. Okay. So, hi everyone. It's really great to see you all here for Why Australia Needs New Storytelling, a celebration of Stephen Mukey and Patty Rowe's new book, The Children's Country, Creation of a Gulara Blue Future in Northwest Australia. This book was published earlier this year by Roman and Littlefield in their Indigenous Nations and Collaborative Futures series. Now, as many of you know, this is the latest book in a long line of creative co-production by Stephen Mukey and Paddy Rowe, Reading the Country, which they co-authored with Krim Benterak in 1984, laid new ground for an approach to cultural writing that unsettled and indeed continues to stimulate deep thinking about the nature of coexistence in Australia. Another book simply titled Gulara Baloo this lovely little gem here was gifted to me just late last week by John Altman, who rescued it from a Canberra market bookstore. Now, given Stephen and Paddy's abiding concern with journeying, this particular copy of a book may well be considered something of a valuable cultural artifact, as its previous home was the now extinct Atsic Library. We will welcome it warmly into new company on our shelves here at IPCS. As we begin, I acknowledge country and its custodians across all of the lands in which we are meeting today. Here in Melbourne, Wurundjeri and Bunurong of the Eastern Kulin Nation, and of course, Gulara Baloo across in the West. And I also warmly and respectfully acknowledge all First Nations people among us. Now, as you all know, we have an exceptional panel of presenters to explore Stephen and Paddy's latest work and its wider provo provocations. They need no introduction in this company and I will just welcome them briefly in the order in which they will speak. Tony Birch is an award-winning writer whose most recent and much celebrated novel is The White Girl. Eve Vincent, is a senior lecturer in anthropology at Macquarie and author of Against Native Title. Chris Healy is an associate professor of cultural studies at the University of Melbourne and author of Forgetting Aborigines. Jason Nungan Rowe is chair of the Galara Baloo Milibinyari Indigenous Corporation and a great grandson of Paddy Rowe. And I should mention that Jason joins us vicariously in a video recording that was made at the Adelaide launch of this book. And finally, of course, Stephen Mukey is Professor of Creative Writing at Flinders University. As you can see, Stephen, Tony and Chris are gathered together just down the hall from me in the Philip Darby reading room here at IPCS. Eve joins us from Sydney. Along the way, Stephen will share with us details of how you can get hold of a copy of this fabulous book. Please make everyone welcome. And now over to you, Tony, to kick us off. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to um, pay my respects to elders past and present here on Wurundjeri country, but also um, all Aboriginal people um, from the Greater Kulin Nation. It's a real privilege to speak here. Um, I also want to say hello to John Altman. He's wearing John Howard's tracksuit. He looks magnificent in John Howard's old Olympic tracksuit. Hey, gun, John. Um, it is a real privilege to be here with Stephen and, and with Chris and, of course, the other presenters. Um, and I think particularly in regard to Stephen, I've known Stephen for many, many decades. And in the last five or so years, while I was working as a um, research fellow at Victoria University um, in Mundani Balak, I did a lot of work on climate change, climate justice and issues of protecting country. And one of the issues that I often discussed and I wrote about um, in several essays was what was the place of non-Aboriginal people in relationship to Aboriginal people protecting country and what sort of relationships were possible that were valuable and that were respectful. And there were two people and their work that I often spoke about and wrote about. Um, one was uh, Debbie, of course, Debbie Rose Bird, and the other one, of course, was Stephen Newkey. And one of the things I said about both of their works was that 
they had made a lifetime commitment to the communities that they were involved in. And to use Stephen Mickey as, as a model, as an example, to say, if you want to commit to valuable, ongoing, productive relationships with Aboriginal people, um, the work that Stephen has done and his dedication to the Galara Baloo mob is a, a wonderful example and a wonderful lesson. And I think what this book does, it, it builds on that um, relationship. It builds on that wonderful um, co-respect between Mob and, and Stephen. And I think the book, because of that, is a remarkable, remarkable example of what can be achieved in a country that is otherwise, I think, still suffering from, from the, the lies of, of colonisation. So I think the book represents a lifetime of um, education on the part of Stephen Yuki. So while he is the co-writer of this book with Paddy Rowe, I think what I learned through Stephen's work and what I learned through Stephen's engagement and relationship with Paddy and subsequently with the Rowe family and, and the Galar Blue Mob is that Stephen is always learning. So that therefore the writing and the work I think is, is ethical, it's humble, and most of all, it's incredibly imaginative. And I said to Stephen when I was on the way down here that um, I've written about someone else who has influenced my thinking in this regard in recent years, and that is a, a scholar called Dwayne Donald, who is a First Nations scholar on Turtle Island, or what people may know as Canada. And Donald talks about what he calls an ethical imagination, which is something that we require if we're going to overcome the recalcitrance of colonisation and a sort of adherence to um, colonial ideas that we should have overcome and disposed of by now. And I think that Stephen's work has always had that ethical imagination as a base and that he is someone who thinks in exciting ways, who thinks in innovative ways, and ways that are respectful of new ideas, ways that are respectful of challenges to the dominant discourse. And of course, in Australia, we're talking about discourses of dominant um, white colonialism. The other issue that I think I, I'm interested in, and I talked to Stephen about this again today, I think there could be nothing more apt than to call this book The Children's Country, because I think in doing that, and in a sense of the notion of children as in past, present and future children running through this book, I think it brings with it both a certain level of responsibility on the part of the writing, but a sort an act of responsibility on the part of the reader, because what, what this book is asking and what our respect for these children and what the respect for children that Paddy Rowe had spoken about so long ago was that we are, our life should be determined by the future for these children, what future um, will these children have and what role can we play in the future for our children? It also links to a notion of the term people may know of future ancestors that could be ourselves to say that rather than get, to get away from the simplistic idea of you know, what sort of country are we going to leave for our grandchildren, to take the leave out of that, what sort of country will we all be part of in the future, even after us? when we become future ancestors, when we think of future children, that that commitment to protecting country is ongoing, it's ceaseless, and it is not in any way a linear construct. So because of that, I think as a reader, I responded with a very particular sense of, uh, to be honest, a really strong emotional um, attachment to this book, a belief in the need to, to respond to this book in, a, in an in an intellectual way, in a creative way, in a political way, and in an, in an energetic way. So I think what the book is asking us to do is to be active, to be engaged with each other and to be active, or what I would see is a sense of collective responsibility that the book is asking us to, to welcome, to take up the challenge of collective responsibility and see it as the way forward for us, as for want of a better term, a, a, a global community. Stephen also alludes to this, I think, very strongly by the way that he talks about time or history. So as Stephen writes, creation didn't happen way back then, but it's always happening right here with us now. And this is so important to know, we're not talking about a past, we're not talking about history, we're talking about what is happening now, what we do now, and how we take that into the future. And then, of course, 
he also adds to that when he says our ancestors are not back then, but are still here now. Again, alluding to that constant presence and that relationship that we have each, with each other. So I see this as an incredible act of generosity on the part of Stephen and Patty Rowe. I see as indicative of that lifelong relationship that they've had. And even though Pat, Patty has technically passed, it is a great example of the fact that Patty is still part of this story. Patty is still central to this story. And it is a case that Patty is the future ancestor who's involved in this process with us. The other thing that we were asked to talk about was the notion of a, a new story or a new way to tell a story in Australia. I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but not in any way to devalue the stories in this book, but to just, I suppose, add a note of caution that storytelling can be incredibly productive. It can be incredibly valuable. And for Aboriginal people who have had our stories sanitised, stolen, denied, silenced, the reality is we need to be able to tell our stories in our own way and we need to have those stories listened to. So I see that as invaluable. But the fact is that stories can be also very destructive. So the story of colonisation, the story of pioneers toiling in a harsh <coughs> event and empty land, the stories of terra nullius, the stories of denial of colonial violence, they are ever present in society. So whatever stories we tell with passion, with truth, in the sense of truth telling, we're always going to be up against those monolithic stories of empire. So that challenge will always be there. And we, we can't simply think just by being able to tell our own story that we can overcome that. We're always going to be challenging those dominant narratives, which are, again, stories of, of denial. So. I'd like to sort of offer a sort of very mild um, idea, um, the way that we could challenge storytelling Australians. One is I think we, we should burn all the flags, we should take down all the flagpoles, we should stop singing national anthems, we should cancel Anzac Day, we should not write at all, and we should all listen. We should all listen to what Aboriginal people have to say. We should become small and listen, and we should accept humility as an offering. We should be much more humble in thinking about storytelling and listening to Aboriginal people is something that Stephen has done for many decades and it's something that I would encourage all of you, but all of us to do, black fellas, when we're, when we're with other black fellas, to listen, to take in what someone has to say and not be so um, at a rush to interrupt and tell our own story. I think we've all got to learn to be better listeners as Stephen has been for so long. So thank you. Thanks very much, Tony. So next we throw to Eve. Hey, thanks, Mel, uh, and thanks, Stephen, for the work uh, and for inviting me to be part of this event. Uh, I'm on Darug country this afternoon, and I pay my respects to Darug people who've long lived on and looked after the waterways and lands uh, of Western Sydney. Um, yeah, I'm feeling pretty left out, the three of you <laughs> down there in Melbourne. Um, but I did have a sudden memory, actually, Stephen, of the last time I saw you in real life. Uh, we ran into each other a very hot, very dry Adelaide day um, in, towards the end of 2019 at Tanafi, the Festival of Contemporary Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Art. Um, I'd flown in that morning from Sejuna out on the far west coast of South Australia in the little 30-seater tin can aeroplane. Uh, and we bumped into each other, I think, that afternoon, uh, looking at the exhibition in the very stately art gallery of South Australia. Um, Prue was there as well. Um, but earlier that day, uh, when I first got in, I went to see a smaller exhibition, also part of Tanafi, called No Black Seas. Uh, this was a show by the Sejuna Arts Centre artists about the proposal to drill oil in the Great Australian Bight. So those choppy freezing waters are a nursery for the southern right whale. And I really noticed that the Gugara, Wirungu and Murning artists in that show had turned to new mediums to uh, explore their relationship to the sea, the cliffs and to the head of the Bight country. So the show featured sculptures in sandcasted glass and marine debris weaving. So literally making art out of uh, the rubbish cast into the oceans. 
uh, happily, this plan to drill for oil in the Bight was abandoned in early 2020. So it's just, you know, it's another moment, another place, another site where a contest erupts, a contest that might seem to be about resources at first glance, but uh, Stephen's new book, Stephen and Patty's new book teaches us these are contests over reality, uh, over knowledge and also over narrative. Uh, so yeah, turning now to the children's country, we follow the coastline along, heading north along the Lurajari Trail, following up the Bagaragara. Is that right, Stephen? Is it the hard G? Bugaragara. 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 Okay. <clears throat> this is the law, the core Galarabalu institution. And Stephen very much borrows from the genre of the Victorian era travelogue, his very charming expository introductions to each chapter. Uh, I also want to follow along today three themes of the book um, and see where they lead us. So I want to talk about this, the term Galarabalu, uh, about new ways of inhabiting um, and also about rebooting authorship. So first, uh, Galarabalu, this is a very complex conversation. Uh, I really appreciated in reading the work that it demands great sensitivity to write about, to discuss. Yeah, I also like Mel, I have a copy of the 1983 edition of Galarabalu, co-authored between Patty Rowe and Stephen Mukey. It does seem like the um, secondhand stores of Canberra uh, a wash perhaps with these because that's also where I got mine and there's a stamp in mine saying uh, the Department of Aboriginal Affairs Library. Um, okay so the book was then republished in 2016 with the subtitle Stories from the West Kimberley and the spelling of Galarabalu has changed over time uh, but more significantly as the children's country explores the meaning and I guess what Galarabalu as a term can do, its effects in the world have also changed. So Galarabalu emerges as an innovation, a creative response uh, generated on a colonial frontier, which makes it possible for various peoples to build back up, to attend to the Bagaragara as part of a confederation, a civilization, in fact. So it's an expansive vision. It doesn't erase other attachments, Jabba Jabba, Yawaru, etc. But this expansive vision, uh, this more conceptual vision, we might say, contrasts with the ask of native title. It's more than an ask, in fact, uh, a, a demand that contemporary Indigenous identities are configured in particular ways as sourced in the pre-contact past, the assumption that language, group name, territory are isomorphic. So the book does two things with that predicament. As we travel with Stephen and Patty Rowe, our understanding of uh, both of these sort of aspects uh, gradually deepens. So the first aspect is, on the one hand, we learn that rights to country and waters in the West Kimberley, rights to speaking about and caring about country might be acquired through ascent rather than descent through spirit children. Uh, this gets called, uh, conception totemism in the much less personal and less readable anthropological corpus. Uh, and then, so we learn about that. And, and I think our understanding sort of gradually deepens of, of the role of spirit children uh, rights uh, inherited through ascent. And we also learn about the machinations of native title proceedings that serve to disenfranchise Galarabalu to reduce the potential of this idea or term um, something I've also documented happening in another place. Um, and uh, I'm really interested, Stephen, in, in the fact that the words trauma and traumatic are both used. I was very struck by that. Uh, generally within this text, interruptions are welcome. Interruptions are a mode, they are a method. They bump us off course, they open up new possibilities. But I felt that this interruption into the idea of Galarabalu was more akin to a rupture with deeply felt effects. Okay, so the second trail I sort of wanted to follow along was this attention within the text to different ways of moving and inhabiting uh, a book made by walking. So embodiment emerges as a key theme of the work, 
Uh, Stephen, you know, early on, it's Stephen who teaches those who gather to walk the Lurajari Trail to glide rather than to march. So to move sort of with country, I guess, rather than on it or against it. We dwell for some time on a very delicate hand gesture, which was captured on film. Uh, Paddy's, Rose, Paddy's Row hand dips and turns like a falling leaf. And then over the course of the walk, uh, we witness these visitors to Galara Blue country, to the coastline becoming more receptive, more responsive to the effects of living country, and they're energized by this responsiveness. So these themes very much, you know, I think I guess less cerebral, I think, than the theme of storying, storytelling, this theme at the level of existence and of the body. Um, and then third, back to sort of the theme of words and stories, uh, I wanted to think about the rebooting or express my appreciation of, I guess, uh, for the rebooting of authorship that happens here. So rebooting is a term used throughout economy, politics, science, need rebooting. Um, yep, totally, I'm on board, that sounds great. Uh, but where to start? I mean, that's, you know, it's really big. And what I came to appreciate was that the work of rebooting is not just something called for, something urged, but it is already happening. Uh, and it's very much happening around the conventions surrounding authorship. Uh, so most obviously, of course, the work co-authored with Patty Rose, Stephen's longtime teacher, uh, who's now deceased, as Tony's been talking about. And so the book fulfills this commitment made many decades ago to write on the topic of spirit children. The title was agreed upon together in 1984. Uh, but then as Stephen glides his way along the trail, he's constantly learning with and from others. Uh, these interlocutors don't get sort of sidelined they're not uh you know there's some of them appear in footnotes and acknowledgements but a, a lot of kind of generous uh citing of others but some have a really strong presence and voice in the text they keep recurring we keep meeting them again uh the conversations with tg theory girl the avid reader of latour uh the extensive collaboration with local historian robin wells uh again this historical knowledge Grass while walking, ambulatory history. Uh, so yeah, authorship as collaborative and dialogical where the professor might feel stuck, turn to the student for help. Um, obviously that happens all the time, but here we see it happening. Uh, the whole of the conversation is committed to the page and the authorship becomes much more distributed in the process uh, and less egoistic. So yeah, I, I like um, Tony's emphasis on humility. So, yeah, that's it from me. Thank, thank you, Stephen. Marvellous, Eve. Thanks very much. Okay, so now we pop back across to Chris. Thanks, Melinda uh, and Tony and Eve for those, those, great, those great introductions to the <laughs> book. Um, uh, like Tony and Eve, I'd like to acknowledge that um, I'm speaking on Cool and Country um, and acknowledge elders past and present. So this is... Um, this is a very uh, homosocial book, a book about Stephen's relationship with Paddy and with uh, Bruno Latour. Um, it's a book about the Lurijari Trail and the successes of Gulara Balu in keeping Woodside Petroleum from establishing a gas processing plant at Walmadani uh, and the failure of Gulara Balu to secure native title rights. It's a complicated book, as uh, we've already heard. Um, or perhaps better, a, a book of complications. And to do it justice in a brief period of time, I just want to draw attention to three aspects of the book. Uh, first, I want to talk about stories. Second, I want to talk about uh, custodianship. And third, I want to talk about uh, country, uh, by which I mean land and sea, amongst other things. Um, so, I'm not sure about whether this book is calling for new kinds of storytelling as this session's been tagged. Um, Stephen and Paddy and a number of the other um, authors, as Eve notes, are certainly storytellers in a way that Tony is also a storyteller and I'm not. Um, but they're all, and certainly all their believers in what Stephen says at one point in the book of stories, 
bringing country and futures into existence. But I don't know whether it's a call for new kinds of stories or a, a different kind of relationship to storytelling. Um, if we think about um, new sorts of stories, um, that's not a new idea. And we can see that in the ways in which people say in cliched ways, each generation you know, produces new stories or particular kinds of storytelling might be welcomed as a new kind of genre or stories as including new types of people as historians uh, are apt to want to do, um, including new kinds of actors, uh, new kinds of voices. But if you look at the, uh, the way in which this book is structured, in part by walking, but also by very conventional structures of storytelling in contemporary culture. Day two is history, day three and four are law, day five science, day six politics, day eight art, and so on. It seems to me that what, um, what Stephen and Patty are wanting to do here is not so much produce new stories, but to look at the ways in which existing kinds of storytelling are no longer possible. And for me, that, uh, that's reiterated again and again in the critique of forms of modernity slash modernization that we get throughout the book. So there's the great moment where uh, Stephen uh, picks up a metaphor from Latour of contemporary life, let's say contemporary storytelling, uh, let's say contemporary ways of imagining ourselves in the world, being a little bit like being on an interminable aircraft flight, where we've taken off from one moment, one world that we can no longer return to, yet we don't know where we want to land. That's Latour's metaphor that Stephen uses. So in that um, capsule that some of us might remember romantically used to be something we used to do fairly regularly before March 2020, um, there's something going on about the impossibility of existing kinds of storytelling. So what's Stephen and Patty's response? It's in Patty's case to tell his stories repetitively to people he's invited to country in the hope that the, that storytelling will reverberate in ways that he can't really know. And in Stephen's case, it's to retell those stories, but also to say that the kinds of storytelling that we're engaged in, in those categories that he deals with, are no longer appropriate. They no longer do justice to the world that we currently inhabit, whether that's because extractive economies have uh, positioned uh, ourselves in a world that we can no longer imagine that future in front of us in the same way as the modernizers, the gas extractors, the miners might have, have imagined. Secondly, the, the question of storytelling seems to me to relate to custodianship. And I was very struck by it at a, a little demonstration at the University of Melbourne last week um, which, like many universities in Australia today, is going through uh, cost-cutting exercises because um, uh, revenue from international students has plummeted and the federal government has been very unwilling to uh, dip its hand into any of its coffers in order to imagine there's a future for universities at the moment. And one of the things the University of Melbourne is doing is sacking all of its ground staff. Now, the current and relatively new Vice Chancellor at the University of Melbourne is very keen on acknowledging uh, Kulin people, um, acknowledging the Wurundjeri, uh, trying to establish closer relationships between First Nations people and various university campuses. But what I think he misses in an exercise to, stack, to sack um, uh, ground staff who've been employed at the university since uh, 1856 um, is that relationships to um, Indigenous people that might be established by an institution like the University of Melbourne or many other institutions are not simply about lip service to custodianship as something that Indigenous people have a responsibility to, but instead might be imagined as something that non-Indigenous people might learn from. That we might learn that ground staff at a place like a university are custodians for an institution that extends not simply to students, but extends to the plants and the animals that make up that place in a way that Patty teaches in relation to the Lurijari Trail. Obviously that connects up to the third thing that I mentioned, which is that question of, of land and country, or it might extend to sea, because 
the example of uh, the proposal to uh, drill in the bite that Eve gave earlier was also something that connected um, uh, Wamadani, James Price Point, uh, to Melbourne uh, because there were, there were protests against that drilling proposal organised by surfers uh, on the west coast of Australia and I participated uh, in both Torquay and, and St Kilda in tremendously uh, innovative kinds of attempts to draw attention to the ways in which a proposal like that at, at Woodside and its impact on spinner dolphins and, and whales and turtles uh, and bilbies might have had, if it went ahead in the bite, a huge impact on the environments that people who surf are interested in on the west coast of Victoria. So it seems to me that um, <clears throat> the, the storytelling that is um, that Paddy is invested in is one that is deeply rooted in country. And I think the challenge that Stephen comes back to again and again, and I'd like him to take it up in the conversation if he could, is how does that very intimate, very grounded, lifelong relationship to a particular country, how is it that that can be something that can um, become an example, become a way in which we can story relationships to country in metropolitan places like Melbourne or like Adelaide or like Sydney and how might those be generalised in specific ways across a country as diverse, as large and as impossible to imagine in the ways that Paddy does at, at a national scale. Uh, so they're my three thoughts about the, the limitations or the caution we might take to new forms of storytelling, maybe, um, maybe more uh, accurately be rethought of as the way in which we can refuse certain kinds of modern storytelling and renovate those in the ways in which Stephen suggested, uh, an attempt to draw attention to forms of responsibility embedded in notions of custodianship. And finally, some questions that arise from a very different kinds of relationships to country that exist in uh, the, the children's country and in the everyday lives of many of us talking here or listening here today. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Chris. We're, um, we're, we're mounting a a, a meaty tray of very uh, significant issues to, to, to try and prise apart and discuss a bit further when we have time. Um, but now we're going to throw to Carlos, who's going to play um, a clip of Jason Rowe. Hello, Adelaide. Jason Rowe here. Great great grandson of Paddy Rowe. Uh, chairman of GMIC, Karatabulu Milibinyari Indigenous Corporation. I would like to uh, recognize all the people, countrymen in Adelaide, that which I'm sending this video to, in all the respects that, uh, for the past and present, which I'm sharing with you. Back in the late 70s, Uncle Steve was working with my father, Uba, an old man Nangan, Lurin Joy Heritage Trail that was given to him by the elders, the old last people of Jabba Jabba tribe, taught him everything but the country, uh, the song line, the Lauren culture, and you know the things what you gotta have to do when you are a custodian of the place. 1930, Uba and Jalbi, they had two daughters which they write come from Menarid. While being spirit children, knowledge has been passed down from both grandmothers about the country. Lian, inside way, it, it tells them, you know, to lead us which way we want to go. If it's bad over there, Lian will tell us. If it's good over there, 
Leon will tell us another way too. So that's how we are scroll. Well, my uncles and aunties was passed down to them. Knowledge down now to us mob. The Lunjari Trail was established 30 or more years ago. Long time, no? Which we walked the song line that comes down this coast from Yellow River right up to Minya Park, Broom. So with the sites in between within the Lurujai Heritage Trail, well, it's very important to all of us, from the grandchildren, the two grandmothers, well, responsibility has been passed down from uncle and aunties, now to us, the younger generation. The sites are very important. That would, that, that is all connected within the song, song cycle, which is the Lurunjari song cycle. That's why we walk with people, like students, all that, and to show them, you know, how sensitive this country is from long time ago. So back in 2007, that's when everything all went pear-shaped in. That's where Woodside stepped in, wanted to make the biggest gas refinery in the southern hemisphere. And that's where, you know, that would trouble us properly. So that was bad news for us. So, you know, all our sites, we had to stand, stand strong and fight for what we believe in our law and culture. So then they fought, well, we had to protest with our family and friends who came in and helped us, you know, for, for what we stand and believe in, you know, because, you know, we wasn't that greedy with country. The country was supposed to be shared. And, you know, when people come in with development, it just, you know, breaks our back that, you know, it is that simple that industri industrialization can come in and, you know, take over whatever they want. So that was the state government and Woodside plan. But that's all, well, we got one better. So we started a protest. So 2012, after a hard fight protesting with friends and family, uh, Woodside decided to pack up and yeah, leave the coastline. It was, it was a big relief. But still today, you know, we still worrying they might come back. And you know, we're not gonna lay down and die for nobody. We're just gonna keep on protecting, you know, our country and our sites, you know, and our song lines. And yes, I'd like to thank Uncle Steve again for another book, uh, Children's Country, the recent one now coming out. It's all in the book, but more information, you know, it tells a lot of stories. And, you know, being, well, you might say, you've been with the family that long, and, you know, taking time to listen to old people's stories, you don't get that anymore. Because everybody, old people die with their secrets, but I like to thank Uncle Steve for being with family and passing down the stories to other people that we know, you know, we want to share that around the world so we, they know what we're fighting for. I'd like to say all the best for the book lodge, Uncle Steve, and the people who are watching it. I hope you guys buy the books because it's very important to get the word out there. And yeah, to let you guys know that yeah, it, it, we still are fighting to protect country yet. And, you know, that will go stand from generation to generation, like what I said. And, you know, I'd like to say thank Uncle Steve once again because it means a lot to us. And from the Gorlarabolo Milibinyari Indigenous Corporation, I hope everything goes well. And I hope to see you guys soon on the Lurigari Trail. After COVID, that means. All right, cheerio, yo. Marvelous, well, I'm very, very pleased that we um, managed to get that working in the end. It wouldn't be right not to be uh, linking across to the Roe family and Galarabalu country um, today. So now we throw to Stephen. Thanks very much, Stephen. Okay, thanks, Melinda, and thanks, Carlos, uh, for organising this event. I'm 
I'm feeling very humbled uh, to uh, to also to be in the company of Eve and Chris and Tony and uh, thank them for their contributions too to this conversation. Um, so Jason Nangan Ro just spoke to you from Gularabalu country, um, which is kind of uh, Yaru country these days. But uh, I just want to uh, point out that on the cover of the book, you have a, uh, another, a, a work of art by another Nangan. This is a Nangan, also known as Butcher Joe. And this pearl shell is a uh, typical West Kimberley artifact that made its way, the kind of thing that's made its way down trade routes across Australia. Um, and that's what I like to think of this uh, story doing, uh, is traveling those trade routes. Um, and pearl shell has been picked up in places as far away from the Kimberley as uh, Central Australia, South Australia, maybe even in Victoria uh, on Wurundjeri country, the greater Kulin nation where we are now. Um, thinking about this um, new story for Australia, I thought, well, yeah, this is kind of, has to be political and it has to be political on, on multiple fronts. And this is in a way what I tried to do with the book, uh, dividing up the, um, not the chapters, the days of walking into, into these different uh, uh, knowledges, history, um, ec economics, the law, um, politics, art, and so on. So that we wanted to tell a, um, a story on multiple fronts, highlighting multiple realities. So this was an argument, kind of Latourian, against um, the tendency to reduce things to one reality. It's a bit like where somebody says, come on, let's be more realistic about this situation. And they're an economist telling you it has to be economic. Or when somebody else says, um, you know, any kind of reduction like that to any one of those categories and making it dominant tends to push the other um, modes of existence or modes of belonging, as I sometimes call them, push the others out of the way. So we have multiple realities or multiple ontologies, and we try to keep them uh, in the air all at once um, as a kind of juggling act. And it's kind of difficult um, because you do have to move from one to the other. And in this case, in this book, look at the way that um, that different knowledge systems, Galarabalu versus so-called Western, um, clash in this little corner of Northwest Australia. One of the things I would have liked to have done with storytelling, uh, now that you, you know, set up this conversation, I've only thought about it now, um, is make the story more enigmatic. Not that, what I said before, let's be more realistic about this and say, tell the story about the way things are, but tell a story in such a way that people are forced to think. You know, it's like a, um, it's like the enigmatic utterances of an oracle or something where um, there's a puzzle, a story that is like a bit like a puzzle. So that takes me to what Tony said about imagination, that um, what's the use of a story if it doesn't make you uh, work out something or conversely, or at the same time, imagine something differently. So um, I don't think I did that really entirely in this book, but maybe some other time I'll get around to doing the story as enigma. Um, but yeah, I think I like the uh, provocation set up by this session about the about storytelling. That we do need um, we do need a new kind of storytelling in Australia. Um, I think because we need to find the right form through which these different ontologies can reveal themselves. So whenever you're thinking in terms of uh, history or economics or history, or sorry, or the, the law or politics, try to find the language in which, um, in which you become sensitized to the mode of existence of that particular um, way of traveling through the world. And let's, let's not forget that uh, this is a case uh, at the moment where we have a kind of massive opportunity where um, as Naomi Klein says about climate change, this changes everything. Um, 
all of these different uh, ways of knowing have the opportunity of revolutionizing themselves, rebooting themselves, move towards some kind of new enlightenment. And we have a model already in Australia with the massive upheaval of invasion and colonization, something that certainly did change everything for every indigenous person in Australia. And they had to think about the future then. What are we gonna do about these white pricks is the way that I imagine uh, somebody might have said up in Broome. Okay, so this new story then won't be a national story, I don't think, about the flags that Tony said, burn the flags, but more of a regional or ecological set of stories uh, where the story you're telling is not trying to unify everything under the, under the nation state, but think more ecologically, uh, regionally, uh, and Eve's discussion of the Galara Blue model is a discussion of a regional governance model um, that kept the peace in that part of uh, the Western Kimberley by bringing together these different language groups. Um, and they call themselves the saltwater people. That's one gloss that's given on the, on the word Galara Blue. We're West Coast people, saltwater people, and then when they're talking about their cousins further inland, they're the riverine or freshwater people. And so elsewhere in the country, you have a more ecologically defined relationship to country. So if we do have to have a new story, then it probably can't be as complex as, um, as this book um, with all its, with, with its multiple realities or multiple ontologies. But it needs to be simple if it's to be communicated to broadly. Um, you know, like Terra Nullius was a pretty simple and powerful story. Terra Nullius is still with us in the form of extraction colonialism. Oh, there's nothing there, you know, we can just pull the stuff out, nothing there. Um, and the other one that's come in in Australia more recently, multiculturalism, is also fairly simple. It just says, let's pluralize the notion of ethnicity in Australia. And that's still with us in a way. The uh, we have survived story is also fairly simple and engaging. It's, um, you know, that emerged in around the early 70s. Um, indi an indigenous story that took that fairly simple form and um, it's, it's still strongly with us, that one. But the one I'm thinking about now that connects with um, the thinking in this book is um, one that my co-author uh, would endorse, I'm sure, and it would take the form of, we belong to country. You know how people say, um, country doesn't belong to us, we belong to country. And when we say country, now with a capital C, as it's come to be um, written in Australia, we have to say all these different countries on this, um, big island continent rather than nation. On this continent, we have all these different countries and we belong to country. So I'm looking forward to applying for my first uh, passport. Um, and it might be, um, it might be on um, where I'm living now on, uh, on Ghana country in Adelaide. And I wanna tell a little bit of a story to, um, I think it might answer, answer Chris's question, um, a way in which, um, stories you know you can tell them you can write them that's all very well but you actually have to experience them mm. so this story is a little something that i experienced with my partner prue and um uh katrina schlonka and other friends when we found down at gulwa which is on the south coast down south of adelaide gulwa there's we came across a place called the kuti shack it's a restaurant we thought fantastic the place where we can have lunch. Kuti in uh, Ngarindjeri language means pippies. So we go into the restaurant and uh, sit down and look at the menu. It looks terrific. And we thought, this is going to be good. This is going to be a great experience, you know, the ritual of having lunch with friends. And so when the, um, when the young woman comes to take our order, well, actually, yeah, she's taking our order. And so I ask her a question. Uh, I think she might be a young Ngarindjeri woman. I say, Kuti is the uh, Ngarindjeri word for pippies, right? 
And she says, yes. And then she tells us a story. It was a, a beautifully pitched story where she might have told it a few times, so it came out really well. So the Kuti Shack um, is something, a little restaurant venture, a little business thing that was set up in conjunction with the Gulwa Pipi Company, which is owned by Ngarindjeri people. So the Kuti Shack owns 10% of all the pipis that are harvested in South Australia. And these are controlled by the uh, Ngarindjeri people through the Gulwa Pipi Company. So they've set up their business, no doubt with the help of, uh, of, of some state funding in the early days. And then she went on to say how the, um, this uh, business keeps uh, Ngarindjeri people employed. She says, we, uh, we're looking after the pippies by having a scientist come every six months to check on their, on their health. She said, we make sure we don't over harvest. In fact, we under harvest pippies. So there was plenty of pippies to go around. You might've heard that kind of story about looking after, looking after country. So we had this story being told as we were eating pippies. I also had a lovely wing of a snapper. That was really good. Um, and so the whole process of uh, experiencing uh, the ritual of having lunch um, with the story being told to us made that very much a um, belonging to country story. So yeah, that's, that's all from me. And uh, yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Um, can I, um, Melinda, I just wanted to um, respond to something or ideas that have come up from both Chris, um, Eve and Stephen. And, and this is um, more thinking about not what's in the book, but the conversation that is, has taken place. I think one of the, the, the issues I'm thinking about is that it's important not to overburden Aboriginal storytelling with a, a collective responsibility or overburden Aboriginal storytelling with some solution to the failures of colonialism. So that I think a lot of non-Aboriginal people who are um, tuned in and who are respectful to Aboriginal people are looking to an Aboriginal story to, to correct the wrongs of Australia. And I, 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 um, I'm respectful of that, but I think it's, it's asking a lot of story. And it might seem odd for me to say this, but I think for non-Aboriginal Australia is the, not only about respecting and deferring to Aboriginal story or knowledge of place, is that non-Aboriginal Australia needs to find a more honest story about itself, about themselves. And I think that new stories need to be told which deny the um, amnesia that we've lived with. The other issue, which is relative to not expect too much from Aboriginal storytelling or see it as a solution to a nation's failures, is that I'm thinking about Paddy Rowe and Chris talked about Paddy Rowe you know, repeating a story. And it goes to Stephen's point about complexity and more enigmatic stories. I, I, I think Stephen is, is sort of undermining the, the qualities of the book because I, I don't think that the book or we need more enigmatic stories. I think that what Stephen has done and what Patty did is to tell stories that have a, a sense of simplicity to them. So the real quality in those stories is that there's an immediacy of engagement. So mm -hmm. a story that Patty might tell, and, and Stephen knows the story of Patty's that I was asked to reinterpret was a story Patty used to tell about the imprisonment of a black fellow from Broome mm -hmm. who repeatedly escapes um, colonial society, you know, being shackled, being placed in a prison cell, and eventually he is killed by getting him drunk and throwing him into the ocean. And there's a clear point in the story, and Patty's talking about how destructive alcohol is to Aboriginal people. So on that level of it, and it might be the misuse of a term, there's a sort of a parable there about colonialism, violence and alcohol. The story is fairly direct and simple. But the way that I see it is that when I was asked to write a version of the story, I found that there were endless layers of engagement so that each layer, each time I read the story, each time I thought about it, I actually learned something new. So mm. in fact, the cleverness of Patty Rose storytelling is that it, it seems simple and direct and it is at one level, but it's never simple and direct. You're always going to be learning. And I think 
for me, that is the quality of the storytelling of the book. It doesn't need to be enigmatic. You are always going to be learning. And that relates to the issue that I'm interested in around the walk. And that is that um, one of the participants in the walk who Stephen and I think refers to as a new friend talks at the end of how much of a greater insight or he, it has given in, into Galarabalu people. And I think that the notion of embodiment or the notion of walking on country is relative to that point I want to make about storytelling and Chris's point about repetition. And that is that each time you take the walk, you are beginning again and learning again. So while you carry a body of knowledge with you from a previous walk, it's remarkable how much you learn that you didn't see or didn't engage with or didn't experience on the first time. So I think finally, that's also a point about time that don't expect too much of the Aboriginal storyteller because the fact is it takes a long time to learn all of this and it's always going to take a long time. So that's why I go back to the point of patience. Um, there, Aboriginal storytelling isn't a solution to a problem. It's a continual experience. It's a continual experience of learning that, that doesn't stop. And its role is not to, 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 to give us a solution. It's an endless sense of learning. And the way that, I'm sorry, Stephen talks about you know, children and the, our future children. Well, it's our future storytelling. So I think it also relates to the sense of humility. Don't, don't expect the, the story to be a, an answer to a problem. Fantastic. Thank you very much to you all. Now, we have more than 100 people on this call, and I'm sure um, a good number of them um, would, would like to, to engage with you. While people are getting themselves together, I just wanted to take us back to Chris's response and this idea that what we need is not new stories, but different kinds of relationships to stories, which if I'm hearing him correctly, is um, inviting us to take the, 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 the heavy weight of responsibility off the storyteller and to think very much about the ways in which we, the readers of the stories, those who, who either do or do not read and do or do not hear, more to the point, I guess, um, a part of the enabling of stories to do their work in the wider world. And I wondered if, if that might be a line of discussion that we could just push a little bit further around the questions of how, what are the sparks, what are the magic moments, what, what, what are the necessary um, uh, sort of disjunctures that enable something to cut through. And I'll put it in those terms because I know all of you have written recently and very powerfully around these very questions. What, 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 is it, what is it that happens in a moment that a story or a performance or some kind of action moves a person and the person is changed and feels charged to go forward in the world in, 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 in the quest of the story, if you like, the story carrying the possibilities of a different kind of Australia. Is, is this something that we can, we can usefully reflect upon just for a moment? And then I'll invite everyone to stick up their hands and um, start coming forth with their, um, their discussions. Well, can I say something, Mel? Um, I mean, I'm not sure that this would satisfy you as a response to, you know, what you've just kind of uh, put to us. But I liked um, Stephen saying then that in the book, the task of the writing in the book is for these multiple realities to reveal themselves. Um, and then Tony sort of put this emphasis on kind of patience and on listening. And I mean, maybe what Chris is maybe saying is that the stories, we don't need these new stories, the stories are there. It's about how do we, you know, conduct ourselves or put ourselves into a kind of position where the stories reveal themselves to us, like the country reveals itself to the walkers. Now, why I'm not sure it would satisfy you, Mel, is that, I, I mean, I feel like I'm imagining something like quite passive in a way. Quite, because I like this idea of Tony's of patience. 
Um, so I guess your metaphors of cutting through, etc., seem a bit more kind of active or something. But but I do I did like I really like that about the book, a sense that it would, if you stuck with it, bit by bit, the country reveals itself to you, the stories reveal themselves to you. The reading Patty Rose words via Stephen for many, many years, you know, they keep on revealing themselves to you. Um, maybe the conditions for these new stories that are actually already there are something to do with receptiveness, attention, patience, humility. Yeah. I think that's um, that's very perceptive. Even the only thing I'd add to that is that the, if there's one argument Stephen's making through the book, it's that all of those things happen at or are enabled by moments of interruption. So the, the walk itself is an interruption to the kinds of normal time that most of us operate with. <clears throat> so and we get a strong sense of that at the end of the walk as the as the trail. Meisters return to kind of normal time. So the walk itself is an interruption. Patty's storytelling is constantly interrupting the, the categories that you know you would normally want to go to. So it's got repetitions of the kind of the story of the Marban who's imprisoned. You know, it happens again and again. So it's the interruptions that are enabling, and that can be conceptual. Um, Stephen draws attention to John Altman's. Uh, int introduction of a new term to hybridize uh, a, a single idea like economy um, in uh, what is sometimes called remote communities. So it's these interruptions that enable new things to emerge. So it's just really to, to reiterate um, or add to what you were saying. I've got a, um, another little story about um, a, a guy called Lord McAlpine who was um, actually a lord from England who came to Broome, uh, discovered Broome. <laughs> and uh, he was a Tory, you know, Margaret Thatcher's treasurer or something. And he had great ideas for Broome. You know, he was going to transform the place. But he was directed to go and talk to Paddy. And so he would rock up to Paddy's tamarind tree, which they called his office. And I say, I've got a great idea. I think we should build some development up the coast, you know, like big hotels and high rises and, uh, you know, swimming pools. And then Paddy would start telling him stories. And uh, after a half an hour or an hour of listening to Paddy, he would laugh and enjoy it and go away happy. And he would have forgotten about the hotel developments. <laughs> um, the only other thing I'd add to um, what Melinda said is, uh, you know, about, I think, um, cutting through or taking up energetically is that I will just repeat that um, when I was asked to respond to Patty's story and I rewrote that as a story called Colours, which is my last short story collection, mm. um, Common People. I think, Melinda, that I, people often ask me, so I, you, know, you know, I do a lot of festival stuff and people often say, oh, do you think writing changes the world? And I, 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 I don't think it does. Um, and I often respond by saying, well, look, when I went to high school in the 70s, every kid I know read Animal Farm, 1984 and Brave New World. We read these anti-totalitarian novels and yet we even had until not long ago a totalitarian regime running a um, democracy in the US. So our, our, our sort of reading around um, to avoid totalitarianism didn't in fact save us. But having said that, the um, antithesis of that is I could point to stories and you said moments where my whole life has been changed by reading a story my whole sense of responsibility is as a as a person so the reason i say that is when i wrote read patty's story and then had to concentrate on reinterpreting it for the story i wrote colors which was about a kid aboriginal kid and his grandfather and his grandfather giving up the grog and becoming a great teacher to this kid and then this kid's life being threatened in a police cell what i would say there if is that as much as I know about incarceration of Aboriginal people and deaths in custody, as much as I know about the shocking rates of incarceration, particularly of our children, 
by reading Paddy's story and by having to think about it and to go to East Point slowly and with patient, patience, it changed my whole mindset about what my responsibility is in relationship to those children. So that again, I think story in that sense to me has a really energetic impact on me as a person, whether that has a knock-on effect to other people, I don't know, because Steve was saying earlier, yeah, Patty telling stories, or sorry, Chris was about, you don't know the reverberations beyond the people you're speaking mm -hmm. to. As writers and storytellers, we have no sense of, you know, how far does that energy extend? And we hope that it, it it's out there and it has a life force and people see value in it, but we can never know and we shouldn't expect, again, we, we can't expect too much because, we don't know what the, what the life force of energy of those stories is now and in the future, and that those stories are really up against a, a really recalcitrant narrative. You know, the mm. story of the nation, that is a big monolithic fucking block. It's a big thing we're trying to move, and it's very difficult to move that. For sure. Okay, the floor is open. I have a comment here from Kev Kevin Murray. Kevin, I don't know if you want to come in and um, talk to this relationship between stories and, and, and the objects that hold them. Well, it's really just to, um, hi, it's really just to invite Tony to talk about, uh, I think it was the essay in Griffith Review, Things of Stone and Wood, about uh, uncovering objects as a way of un unleashing certain stories that sort of disrupt a sensibility and clearly that's been very important in terms of cultural artifacts and so on that contain these stories perhaps similar to country but i wonder if tiny could reflect on that yeah. i don't want to steal any more of stephen's time i'll just say briefly that the story kevin i suppose the centerpiece of the story is um and karen jackson who's in the room she was at the same um, we went to the funeral of a friend's father, Kim Kruger, her dad's funeral, and we were all offered an object from a table. And in that essay, I wrote that it was like going to a trash and treasure store. Yeah, there was nothing that you could steal that you could pawn and get a lot of money out of, but there was books, old paperback novels, there was um, garden tools, and this stone that I picked up, and it was just the object that Kim asked me to take home. I suppose the point about that, and to go back to humility, is to hold that stone in my hand and feel how strong it was, and to feel its force, was to recognise that it was much that it was more powerful than I was. To defer to that stone's authority and to, to defer to that stone's um, central power, and and as much as that sounds a bit weird to some people, it really gave me a strong sense of how I need to see myself on country and protecting country. But the only other aspect of that is that my attachment to various objects is because not it's not a sentimental attachment. It's that the knowledge of the stories that relate to those objects allows those stories to become very contemporary for me. So they might seem like nostalgic, historical reminiscences of, of childhood, but having those objects with me and around me, it's a bit like Stephen talking about you know, your ancestors being now. These stories are about now. They're not reminiscences of childhood. Mm. Anyone is welcome. Oh, hello. My name's Dennis. Can you hear me? Yep. We can. Uh, Yes, um, I'm just wondering about the, the notion of uh, the fact that we as listeners change over time and we can hear a story at the age of 20 and it might impact on us in some way. And we can hear the same story 40, 50 years later and it has huge impact. Uh, why? The story hasn't changed. But we have, um, the listeners uh, has changed, life has changed her or him. Uh, it's the idea, the image uh, of a spiral staircase comes to mind where we can be walking over the same ground as we ascend. 
by covering the same ground, the same written words, the same spoken words. But we now see it from a, a higher place or from a different angle. So I suppose I, I would like to ask Stephen, um, some of the recorded stories that you have from Paddy Rowe, Stephen, uh, when you first heard them 30 years or so ago. I wonder if you now read them or reflect on them, whether you actually take something from them, uh, whether they're more multi-leveled than you ever imagined uh, at, the, at the very first time of hearing Paddy tell his story. Talking about listener mutability, how we change over time. Yes, so uh, thanks, Dennis. I, um, I don't think I've uh, radically changed in, my, in what I'm learning from those stories. I'm always learning a bit more and I never tire of them. Um, and maybe sometimes I have a, a, different, uh, a different insight, but pretty much it's remaining the same. Um, um, and I think they're probably remaining the same for the um, Paddy Rose uh, family and descendants. Um, the old man's stories are, are treasured by them and as they are, but not as they are changing, I don't think. I'm just thinking that um, since I became a parent, I can now hear stories that impact on me in ways um, they never did when I was a young man and not a parent. Um, but maybe, that's, maybe that's for me alone. Um, but I do think, I, I, I always discover that when I think it's for me alone, it's not. It, I, I never experience anything uniquely. Um, these dynamics are for everybody. Uh, hello, thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. Would anyone else like to come in? Hi, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, I'm on my friend Jacob Matthews' screen, and so I'll just speak. Thank you very much for your, your talk, all of you. Um, I was just thinking about industrialization and, and the kind of rise of science, and with that, the concomitant kind of destruction of myth. And I, I think it was you, Eve, that spoke about the um, not just a, a pitch between in resources and um, extractive industries, but also um, a civilizational shift in, in meaning. And I think the word storytelling, one word that hasn't come up is myth. And there's something about the endurability of myth that also in a way has, there's no authorship to it. And it's also quite enigmatic. And I was thinking, I mean, what your thoughts might be in relation to storytelling and, and the idea of myth as a kind of anti-science, anti-certainty, uh, but a very rich symbolic uh, potential. I think that's for you, Eve. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was all for Stephen. Oh, look, I mean, I was throwing that out to everybody, I guess. But no, yeah. all good. Um, I guess it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because myth has such a negative valence in terms of um, that's just a myth, as in it's untrue and therefore it has no um, kind of force in the world. I guess uh, that would be the the obstacle to embracing 
the potential of myth, potentially the more enigmatic genre um, and, and the other sort of potential that you, you point to within myth. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I know that there has been a real kind of a movement away from categorizing uh, First Nations dreaming stories as myths uh, because, because of those sort of negative connotations that that is seen as uh, devaluing them, um, kind of sorting them as, as belonging to kind of, you know, not, not truthful, not of this time, et cetera. So it would be quite a move back to the idea of myth. That's, that's sort of my first thought which, you know, is a bit of a, a tired end of the day thought, I guess, like that sounds hard. Um, I, I don't know, do you guys have more thoughts on myth, the power and potential of myth? Yeah, I do. Um, so the um, companies coming into the Kimberley trying to set up a natural gas plant and industrializing that area eventually, have a um, have a story to tell about modernization and progress and um, and I was uh, I was playing with the idea that actually there were it was kind of science fiction that they were projecting a future that um, they couldn't necessarily even bring about and they didn't um, but it was the kind of future that says oh well we've modernized the rest of the world we can just continue to do the same sort of thing here um, but. But the, uh, they got um, approval to go ahead, you know, political approval on the basis of um, a business plan. Well, it wasn't really a business plan at all. It was, um, it was a projected fiction of everything is going to be better for the people who live here if we're allowed to build this huge gas plant. And the counter argument was a different kind of story that no, that won't necessarily be a better future for us. So you see similar sorts of mythologies at play in, uh, in the current uh, juxtaposition that I see between uh, the colonization of Mars, number of stories are circulating, versus, um, come on, we've got to fix up the Earth first. The colonization of Mars really is predicated on a lot of science fiction. Mm. Carlos, you wanted to come in. Coming through here. Sorry. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Apologies earlier for the, the interruption at the wrong moment. Um, 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 with, you know, wasn't sabotage, it was slight, slight glitch. Apologies for that. Um, I am, um, last night here at the Institute, we, the, the Institute's kind of post-colonial reading group was uh, discussing Stephen's book, and we had we had a wonderful kind of um, discussion uh, around it. And, and you know, we read about half of it. So the two or three comments I want to make or questions are, of course, referencing only half half the book. And so uh, I'm really really just relaying some of the points that were kind of raised last night. So um, one of them was I think um, there was this interesting discussion about how obviously important Paddy Rowe was obvious to you know to the to the story that Stephen is telling us, but I think we were also struck by the importance of Latour, of course, for this particular story. And, and we were wondering about the, maybe the, the limitations or the difficulties, um, difficulties around that. Um, another point, I think this was in one of the footnotes and it generated a good laugh and, and, and lots of conversation as well last night. And it was this point, and, and I think um, Stephen referenced it a little bit earlier on in the conversation here, where there was a footnote, Stephen, where you say something along the lines, I, I can imagine a future or a present where um, citizens, residents, migrants um, might ask each other things like, um, what country have you walked on? Rather than um, what school did you go to, right? And, and, and we, we loved all the shifts that were kind of implicit in this new question. So, you know, not the hierarchy, and all that, you know, all that kind of nonsense that goes around placing people 
um, in, in relation to the elitism of, of, of schools and those sorts of backgrounds, but rather, um, you know, what country have you, have, you, have you walked on? And we thought that was fantastic. And finally, the book, the book finishes with a discussion around civilization. Um, I think Chris kind of referenced that. Um, and I, I wanted to draw you out a little bit on that, on, on, on the way in which civilization was kind of um, brought in to, to finish the book, right? Um, to finish on, on, on that point. And um, thanks. Is that over to me? It's all for you. Thanks, uh, thanks Carlos. Um, the, uh... The, um, I've found uh, Latour very productive in the way that um, politics for him has become uh, multi-species, multi more than human, um, where the agency of the non-human is, um, is, is taken as, re as real, you know, the, the agency of non-political, I'm sorry, the agency of non-human actors in, uh, and we saw this, but then you know, it was great to see that sort of thing happening on the ground in the uh, anti-gas campaign in um, in Broome, where the bilby is given a voice, uh, the bilby is given a performance, far a human. Um, the whales have a part to play, um, so that really uh, that worked for me. And the limitations were well more along the lines of um, um, that. Uh, uh, when you're involved in a campaign, a political campaign, like uh, the anti-gas campaign in that country, um, Latour, we found limitations in Latour where, to the extent that he would say, well, we have to put our trust in institutions. And we, uh, I felt that that was a little bit too, um, had too much confidence in, in a European so-called Western system of of a set of institutions that needed to be described uh, because I was putting them right up against um, the, uh, the other institutions, the Gulara Blue ones, and especially the Bugatta Gutta that were being crushed by the, um, the juggernaut of modernity. Um, and so that relates to the question of, of civilization uh, because the, the, the people on the trail um, uh, and make, sort of making jokes on the bus coming back from their eight, nine day walk and they making jokes about going back to civilization and then wondering um, if they're going back to barbarism. Um, and the, um, the, point about, the point about the discussion of civilization is that we have the opportunity uh, and people have been talking about it in relation to the interruption that has been COVID that yeah, we can rethink um, various institutions that make up so-called Western civilization. And in Australia in particular, reboot them on Aboriginal country um, in, to the extent that you say to yourself, well, it's not all about living in cities for a start. It's, um, it's about acknowledging that heritage and maybe negotiating because we're all living in this country in these countries, um, negotiating, saying, okay, what are the good bits that everybody's got to offer? And what are you going to um, carry forward for, your, for the future generations? Um, maybe we won't, maybe we'll try to abandon some barbaric acts that could come from any group. Um, and maybe we'll try to forge some more productive ones. So that's what um, the argument about rebooting uh, civilization um, was, was uh, trying to, yeah, that, that's how the kind of apparatus that well, I was imagining could be put into place, but to some extent it's happening and we've had huge opportunities in Australia, like the, the Mabo moment was a great moment for rebooting um, Australian law, but was quickly pulled back by Howard's 10 point plan. Um, it was a bit too scary for white Australia, that one. So um, these moments pop up and if the conditions are right, maybe they can be retained. Um, I, that was, a, I think, a wonderful um, comment on, on what Stephen had written about in relationship to maybe we, we ask people 
whose country they have walked on rather than what high school they went to or where, mm. they, where you come from. Um, I can answer this. I was really struck by that. I can answer this as a real time experience. I, I went to Turtle Island to Canada in, in 2017. Um, I arrived at the airport and picked up a newspaper and read a shocking um, long essay about a First Nations young woman who was 18 years old who died in a, a, a tent that was camped on the side of a highway. She died of a, of a drug overdose. I then um, went to the Banff Centre. Um, I realised that I'd arrived in Canada on Canada Day, which was the 150th year of the occupation of First Nations land. 150 years, and I read at the same time that 150,000 um, First Nations children had been taken from their families and placed in residential schools and institutions. And I listened to a radio program which was talking about the Royal Commission into the murder of Aboriginal women and girls. And those three events, not only were they reflective of Australian history or colonial violence, it was a great sense of despair to be on the other side of the world and, and alone and, and feeling incredibly depressed, incredibly disheartened by that. And then I was walking along the Bow River, which is near the Banff Centre one night, and exactly the point that Stephen has made in the book, I had this, I don't know, revelation that rather than ask what country I'm in, in Canada, whose country am I on? Whose country is this? Whose First Nations country is this? And as soon as I had that realisation, my attitude changed completely. I still felt you know, great sadness for what I'd read and heard, but I also felt responsible. I had to be responsible to what I'd read and heard and had to be responsible to those people. And just by knowing that and recognising and acknowledging whose country have I walked on, I think there is a great opportunity, again, to be more engaged, to be more responsive and to be more responsible to, to Aboriginal people and, and of course, um, First Nations people and everybody. I think leaving us with those those comments around responsibility is an excellent way to um, wind up this discussion. It's been tremendous. I feel like we've really just, um, while well, you collectively panel and the great um, uh, kind of provocations that have, have, have come in on the discussion have given us a lot to, to think with um, at a time when we're really just starting to think about um, some of the real practical implications of these issues um, in new ways. Well, maybe not in new ways, but certainly in new contexts. We have the, U the Uruk Truth Telling Commission being assembled here in, in Melbourne as we speak. This is a, going to be a process that will be incredibly interesting to see how it unfolds. Obviously, there are lots of potential pitfalls along the way. Um, questions about how we talk to each other about these issues in which we're all collectively invested and how, um, how we can imagine a different kind of future, both through story, through new ways of talking and listening to each other um, is something I think certainly everybody here on the call is um, very, very much invested in. So thank you so much to all of you. Thanks Stephen and Patty for your marvelous and inspiring work. Thanks, Chris, Tony and Eve for your very thoughtful um, contributions here today and for giving us all so much to think about. And thanks to all of you for coming along. Um, we've not shared with you um, the flyer for the book. We will find out how to do that and we will email um, that material to everybody who's been here today so that if you would like to purchase the book, um, you'll be able to do so. And I think perhaps also with a special discount, if I'm right, Stephen. Um, anyway, even if it's not with a special discount, it's certainly worth buying. Um, and we hope to see you all again soon and hopefully increasingly more of you in the room than just three. Okay, have a beautiful evening. All the best. <laughs>